Should schools reopen? That depends on what you're optimizing for. Learning loss, mental health, and economic factors are just three of the features out of many that surely could be considered in the loss function you want to minimize when making a decision about what to do. In today's episode, Carly Lupton Smith shares her research and analysis of survey data collected related to the academic, socio emotional, and health impacts of school policies. My name is Carly Lupton-Smith, and I'm affiliated with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And what are you studying there? I am a PhD student studying biostatistics, and my research interests are broadly in causal inference with mental health applications and also substance use questions. What brought you to the intersection of kind of the data and math side of this with the health questions as well? I have always really been interested in health, but have felt like I wanted to also use my math skills. So when I heard of the field of biostatistics and data science and machine learning, I felt like that was the perfect balance of using my skills and then also answering questions that I thought would have a really big impact on the world. And kind of just bringing in my background and interest in mental health has been a really big part of my passion for the statistical methods and applying them to some really important real data. Have there been any big surprises in the way that, uh, as you've been learning them, statistics and machine learning can apply to the field? I think that I didn't realize how complicated mental health data was. I always thought that you could use a subscale, use a questionnaire of some mental disorder, and I felt like that was that. But I think learning about how complicated data is has been really impactful in my PhD process so far. And it's been something that is a big part of the paper that we're going to discuss as well. And I feel like learning about missing data and validating subscales and things like that, and how complicated sometimes statistical methods need to be to handle all of that has been really interesting. Yeah, mental health data seems, the more I think about it, the more challenges I see in how to actually even get access to some data. Can you talk broadly about what the data sets or data collection methods are? What kind of data is available? Well, I think that especially, I mean, going directly into the COVID pandemic, I think it's been really challenging because questions that have come up have been very unique. Specifically, I guess we'll talk some about school data. And school data has been really interesting because the schooling policies have been so varied by location and by time. And it's been really challenging to find data that is truly reflecting the state of the world. And sometimes the state of the world can vary based off of different levels of measurement. So that's school specific. And then in terms of mental health, I'm not a big expert on mental health data collection, but I've been involved in a project right now and we are trying to collect data using some data from some randomized control trials and some EHR data. And there are definitely some hoops to jump through and you have to figure out what kind of variables are necessary and what is not necessary to really get the right data that you need. So the pandemic began, that was a thing that happened, and sort of a stair-step modal change for uh, lots of people and organizations and processes. At what point did uh, online schooling get on your radar as something unique and interesting opportunity to study? So my advisor happens to be very involved in the intersection of education and health policy. And something that happened was we found out about this data set that is run by the Delphi Group at Carnegie Mellon, and they're in partnership with Facebook. And it's called the COVID-19 Trends and Impact Survey. And they added a question about schooling. And that was something where we were really interested in learning about what the actual schooling modalities were that children were experiencing. So if it was virtual or on-site or hybrid. And then just from my own personal experience, right when the pandemic hit, I, in my family, the different experiences that me and my sister faced, and then everyone that I know just feeling a very direct impact of virtual school and then going into the literature and seeing how much was coming out about the potential impacts of schooling policies, whether it was the benefits of keeping kids virtual and preventing spread of COVID-19, but then also the potential downsides and things that I didn't think about in the first place. And there's a lot of aspects of closing schools that can be harmful and can exacerbate disparities. And so it became something that I was really interested in And it started with this Facebook data set when I realized that we could do our best to try and start learning about this because there's not a census data 
question that asks about school being virtual versus in person. Like once the pandemic hit, it became something that we really had to adapt to. And it was this novel idea of virtual school and just something that so many people have questions about, but it's so hard to have the right data for. So that's where this paper got inspired and trying to reveal what data is out there and how consistent different data sets are based off of different levels of measurement. So I hope we can dive deeper into the survey. Can you talk a little bit about the particular questions that you think could be insightful to these questions? Or, you know, what are the just broad strokes that the information collected that could be insightful here? Maybe I'll give even more of an overview of the Facebook survey. Like I said, it's by the Delphi Group at Carnegie Mellon, and it's called the U.S. COVID-19 Trends and Impact Survey in partnership with Facebook. So I'll probably call it the Facebook survey. And they also have a global version run through the University of Maryland. And it is a daily cross-sectional survey, and it stratifies by U.S. state. And every day it invites a new stratified random sample of adult Facebook users. And it displays the survey invite at the top of a user's news feed. Some people listening might have taken it or might have seen it. I know I have friends who have seen the invite and they take the survey. And it's began collection on April 6, 2020, and it's been going on ever since. And every day they get at least 40,000 on average respondents. So it's a huge data set and it's been really valuable for researchers asking questions and wanting to learn about the state of individual household level experiences. And when it hit November of 2020, they added a question about school experiences. So they had already been asking respondents if they had children in school in ages K through 12. And then they added a question that said, if so, if any of the following applied to children in the household. So if they were going to on-site classes full-time or going to on-site classes part-time, and both were yes or no. And we took that question and we said if a respondent put yes for either of the full-time or part-time, the children were going to school at least some of the time on-site. And then otherwise, if they put no for both, and we said they were attending no on-site school at that point in time. So that was a really helpful question because it's one of the only data sets that we've seen that has been collecting data for a very long time throughout the pandemic. Like I said, since April 2020, still going on today, and it is reaching such a broad audience. So it's global and we're focusing on the United States and this specific question, but having a nationwide survey that asks about schooling experiences at the household level has been really helpful because different schools, so if we look at the county level, there's a lot of data that's saying what the county policies are for certain weeks, certain months in terms of whether schools are open for on-site attendance or not. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every individual in that county is actually attending school because a lot of school districts have allowed for parents to make a decision as far as if their kids are going to go to school or not. So we think it's super valuable to have this granular level of data. And we wanted to make sure and kind of validate this data set with some county level information and compare it with the policy data. I love the fact that you can drill down in this hierarchical way. But if for the moment we stay at the top level, do you have any just rough stats on, you know, percentages of I'm neither a parent nor am I in school? So I don't really even have a sense of how popular these modalities are. What's typical in the United States right now? So according to our data sets that we used when we did just an overall weighted average, according to this Facebook survey at the household level, it was a weighted average of about 57 and a half percentage of households had children exposed to at least some level of on-site instruction between December 2020 to May 2021. And then according to the county level policy data, the county population weighted average percentage of any on-site school available in the nation, according to Burbio, which is a data set that looks at school policies by county. And they said that it was 72.6%. So there was a fair amount of school offered on site and it increased over time, which is some of our analyses showed between December 2020 to May 2021, every month involved an increase in on site schooling available and also attended. But there's a difference between what the policy says is available for school on site and then what's actually happening for households. So this is a fairly big discrepancy. I mean, there are two different ways of measuring it, so we wouldn't expect like a precise thing to three decimal points, but there's a 15 percentage point spread here. To what can we account that? 
A lot of different factors. If we look more granularly at the state level and then at the county level, we see pretty high correlations, but also pretty high root mean squared errors between different measures. So patterns are kind of similar and relatively reliable from what we're finding, relatively consistent, but the differences are kind of large still, like the continuous differences between measures. And one reason for that, so the Burbio data set, which we use to reflect county level policies, they report weekly measures and they gather their data by searching school district websites or using sources like Facebook to gather information. And then they release aggregate data at the county level. And if a certain district or county offers multiple options for schooling, such as a hybrid option or a fully on-site option, they denote that as fully on-site. They aggregate up to the highest level of available school. So We expected there to be an overestimation or just a higher estimation according to this Burbio county policy as opposed to the actual behaviors. And we're also finding that when we look at the individual data for the Facebook results and we look at our regression where we looked at the percent of on-site school according to a bunch of different county level factors, we found that there were certain factors of the county related to higher percentages of on-site school. So things like more white residents in the county, higher Gini coefficient, which indicates income disparities, higher population density, things like that were associated with higher percentages of on-site school in the Facebook data set. But also we looked at interactions between source, so Burbio versus the Facebook data set versus another data set, which I could also talk about. We looked at interactions between source and county factors to see if these differences, like you're asking, if the differences between sources were somehow related to county level factors. And we did find there were some interactions. So for example, computer access had a significant interaction with source. So we found that based on different levels of computer access in the county that affected the differences between the measures of on-site school for the county level compared to the household level. There's a lot of questions with this data. There's a lot of different aspects to consider, and it's challenging to figure out what the truth is. But I think we're seeing that just because two sources are different doesn't mean that one of them's wrong. It might just mean that they're measuring completely different overall ideas. So if you compare national to local, is it as simple as maybe that the nationals then being an average and the average kind of waters down some of the more local phenomenon? Or is there a bigger picture here? Yeah, I think that because everything's so household specific during the pandemic and because a lot of school policies change very quickly and kind of open and then close and some schools are different than others, I do think that that could be somewhat the case. I think also that importantly, The Facebook data set includes private schools, Catholic schools, and the policy data sets are focused on public schools. So that's another aspect where it gets kind of messy and hard to compare. But I feel like, again, it's important to just figure out what you're trying to measure. So future research, if we're trying to look at the effects of county level policies on county mental distress or something like that then these policies are truly collected by Burbio. They validate there's some consistency with the household level behaviors, but there's a difference still. And so then if we're trying to look at an individual's decision to attend school or not and how that family is at risk for COVID-19 exposure, we want to make sure we go at the granular level. Is your research at the stage where you can give advice to policymakers on how they might want to adapt what they're doing? I think that if policymakers use an accumulation of other research that's also been done, so one paper led by Justin Lessler, and I was involved in this paper, it looks at how individuals living with a child attending school on site, how their risk for COVID-19 is affected. And they found that individuals living with a child attending school on site between November 2020 to February 2021 did have an increased risk of exposure and getting COVID-19, but this risk was reduced if mitigation measures were put in place. So if there were at least seven mitigation measures like masking and distancing, there was no longer a significant relationship between having a child in school on site and getting sick with COVID-19. So I think that's a big result and important for policymakers to understand that there might be a risk if kids are coming back to school for potential COVID-19 spread, but that risk 
is reduced if there's mitigation measures put in place. Some of that might be a little bit less relevant as cases are changing. So if we get to more of an endemic state, hopefully these mitigation measures will be considered in a different way. But this was a really important result. And then at the same time, school closures can be harmful for children who rely on school as a supplier of meals or health care, and there is a potential for learning loss. And so it's, I think policymakers have to weigh a lot of different things here and understand the importance of school for children and on-site school specifically. And then according to this specific paper where we compare different data sets, the goal of this paper was not necessarily to show an outcome and how education has affected anything, but instead to reveal that when making decisions, it's really important to look at different levels of measurement and figure out what makes sense the most for you, your specific research question. And I think this has shown that household decisions do not always equate to county policies during this specific pandemic and difficult education scenario. So I think that policymakers in this case should realize that their policy matters, but individual household decisions also matter. So it's very challenging to measure the true state. Thanks to our sponsor, ClearML. ClearML is an open source MLOps solution users love to customize. It helps you easily track, orchestrate, and automate ML workflows at scale. Machine learning is no fad. Your organization is only going deeper on investment. Don't let this be a source of technical debt. ClearML can improve every step in your ML workflow, making it a tool loved by data engineers, ML engineers, DevOps people, and data scientists alike. ClearML is hands down the best collaborative ML tool with full visibility and extensibility. As a contributor on a machine learning team, ClearML amplifies your efforts. As a manager, ClearML gives you the transparency and metrics to guide your team's efforts effectively when you can't get pulled into the weeds. Their solution logs your entire process. Your data and models are versioned, so there's no questions of provenance or audits that can't be done. Model repositories give you a clear view of available binaries, and you can deploy pipelines directly from code. Supercharge your entire development process. Go check out ClearML today. Visit clear.ml to get started. On Data Skeptic, we talk to researchers, scientists, and entrepreneurs working to drive real innovation in using data-driven intelligence. From forecasting weather patterns to anticipating stock market movement, we've heard a lot about the many exciting and ingenious methods used to pave the way towards insight. But to unlock the promise of advanced analytics and machine learning, you're going to need a data warehouse. That's where our latest sponsor, Estera, enters the picture. Their no-code platform gives users all the tools they need to bring together data from disparate applications and systems, cleanse and enrich it, then consolidate it on the cloud or on-premises. Astera is focused on user experience, automation, and being a comprehensive ETL pipelining solution that fully empowers domain and data experts to take charge of their journey to insights and craft a solution that meets their needs. The resulting process is fast, agile, intuitive, and most importantly, future-proof, so your data warehouse is always ready to deliver cutting-edge reporting and analytics. To find out more about the Astera platform, get in touch with the team at astera.com slash contact dash us. Astera is A-S-T-E-R-A, astera.com slash contact dash us. Are there any covariates that could help make that, you know, household level decision a little predictive? For example, do local politics, you know, if it's a especially red or blue county, maybe the age composition, are there any factors that are predictive of those choices? In this paper, we have not looked into what affected the decision. There actually hasn't been a ton that has impacted the decision to reopen. One paper by Hartney and Finger, they published this in 2020 and they looked at mass partisanship and the strength of the teachers' union and found that those two factors were the strongest predictors of a district's decision to reopen or not reopen schools. They also included severity of COVID-19 in the area as a predictor, and that actually was not predictive of the decision to reopen or not reopen schools. So it was partisanship and strength of teachers' union in their study. Unfortunately, we yeah, we do not have any part of our paper or work yet that I've seen that looks at factors affecting an individual's decision, but I think that's 
an excellent question and something that now that we've looked more into this large scale Facebook data set run by the Delphi group, that's a question that we could answer and we could look into factors involved with the decision. And then we could also employ the policy data. So we could say, given that a county is open for on-site school, what factors affect the household level decision? And I think we've touched a couple times on this data set with the Delphi group, but I believe you also looked, as you mentioned, a more national data set, maybe some others. Could you expand on the totality of the data sets you had available? Yeah. So like I said, the Delphi group at Carnegie Mellon, their U.S. COVID-19 Trends and Impact Survey, it's a broad scale national survey, about 40 to 50,000 respondents every day. And for every respondent, we get their county information. So we're able to aggregate up to U.S. county. And there's also weights provided in this survey to hopefully make this Facebook sample more representative of the general population. As I've mentioned briefly as well, another data set is Burbio, which is a data service company, and they provide data about schools. And during the pandemic, they started providing weekly measures that are publicly available for the percentages of public schools in each county that are offering only virtual school, combination of virtual and on-site school, or only on-site school. And to obtain their data, they search school district websites, or they use other sources like Facebook to gather their information, and they release aggregate data waiting by rough enrollment of the districts based on district size. So in our comparisons, we focus on the largest, most populous 460 counties because those are just the most reliable. There's the largest sample sizes in our Facebook data set as well. Importantly, Burbio is only public schools. And then another really interesting data set that we found and could be really impactful for future research is called the U.S. School Closure and Distance Learning Database, and we call it the SCDL for short. It's run by Paralyn and Lee, and they published on this data set in 2021. And this data set uses anonymous phone GPS data from SafeGraph, and they have information about phone GPS visits to schools, and they estimate the year-over-year changes in the number of visits to a school in each month of 2020 and 2021 compared to the same month in 2019. So for example, for May 2020, they have the number of visits to a given school, and they compare that to May 2019 number of visits, and then they used a measure of the estimated share of schools with at least a 50% year-over-year decline in in in-person visits in that month. And then they denoted that as the percentage of schools in a district that are closed or mostly closed. So we kind of inverted that and we said one minus that should be the percentage of schools that are mostly open in that month and in that region. And they have information at the district level, the county level, census tract, and state levels. So this is a really cool data set as well. And when we looked at this data set in comparison to the Facebook data, we found very similar results, which makes sense because they're getting at very similar levels of measurement. So they're getting at direct visits to schools and the Facebook data is responses to a survey that are saying children are going to school at least part-time in person. So we compared these two data sets across the entire country. We had an estimate of 57.5% of households with children exposed to any on-site instruction according to the Facebook survey. And meanwhile, for this U.S. school closure and distance learning database, the estimate was 58.5% of students in the nation. So just a difference of 1% here. And they these two data sets had relatively low mean squared error between them and high correlations. So kind of consistent with the idea that the number of visits to a school and the amount of children attending school on site are pretty similar at the granular level, while they might not be completely as similar to what the policy is saying, because the policies are flexible. And then one other data set that I did want to mention is called MCH Strategic Data, and they have district-wide designations of teaching methods. So that's one other helpful data set. We did not use this data as much in our comparisons because we primarily compared on the county level, and this MCH data is only available on the district level, so it's a bit challenging to reliably aggregate from district to county. But MCH also does have district-level data that we looked at briefly. Well, as you described the pandemic era as a dynamic thing, policies are changing a lot. It seems like some sort of longitudinal study would be good to have here. Can you talk about what's ongoing or what's in the future of your research? Yeah. So for this data set, our length of time was from December 2020 to May 2021. And that was because we started in December because that was once all the data that we were using 
kind of started really reliably collecting. And then May 2021, we ended because it was right before the summer. And then we began doing our analysis. And this is something we could start up again. I think future research that would be really interesting is now that we have compared these data sets to really either pick one or pick one or two and look at the long-term trends of individual counties and how that affects a certain outcome of interest. So things like learning outcomes, test scores, or mental health outcomes of both children and parents and COVID-19 cases. So I do think that the longitudinal aspects are really important. We haven't done much with the school data yet, aside from this six-month time frame, which is still relatively longitudinal, and we were able to look at the differences across time. One different project that has focused on longitudinal data using this Facebook survey run by the Delphi Group is a paper that I was involved in, and it's called Factors Associated with County-Level Mental Health during the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, we use this broad scale survey. And we went from April, 2020 to July, 2021. So over a year long time period. And we were able to track the prevalence of percentages of individuals feeling anxious, depressed, and isolated. And it's shown some really interesting results and seeing when the spikes were of different levels of distress. For example, the winter time of 2020, 2021 had some pretty high levels of anxiety, depression, isolation. And then right at the beginning of the pandemic, there was high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression as well. Not clinically significant questions, but just in terms of using our Facebook survey that asked a question about how often were you feeling anxious or depressed or isolated. So I just think there's a lot that can be done with this data set now since it has such a long time period. And within this mental health project, we did include living with kids as a potential predictor in our models. And we found that if a county had more individuals living with kids, once we controlled for a bunch of other variables, that county actually had lower percentages feeling anxious, depressed, and isolated. That's something that's, we can't then bring that down to the individual level. That's just a result at the county level for overall percentages of living with kids. Something that I think would be really interesting is diving in deeper and now using living with kids and whether these kids were going to school on site or virtually and how that's affected anxiety, depression, and isolation. So I think there's a ton of questions that are still yet to be answered. And the biggest challenge is having the right data. And this podcast being called Data Skeptic, I think is so important. And I think it's so important for data scientists and statisticians and computer scientists to really find the right data because sometimes we take data for granted. And this school paper is trying to show that data during the pandemic is really hard to collect, hard to validate. But we're hoping that now that we've shown what's there and done some comparisons across different levels, we can now use this data to answer really important questions about the impact of school policies. Well, having looked at these separate, siloed, sort of independent data sets, it would be great if multiple lines of independent evidence led to the same place. Uh, Can you talk about the consistency you observed? Yeah, so we saw pretty high levels of consistency at the state level and at the county level. We had moderate to high correlations on all of the data sets that we used. We did have that Burbio, the county level policy, had higher percentages reported overall compared to the other data sets. But again, a lot should be related to our hypothesis that just because a county is offering school on site doesn't mean everyone's going. But we did find pretty high levels of consistency considering and mainly in terms of the patterns. So data sets were following similar patterns for when there were lower amounts of on-site school, when there were higher amounts of on-site school. And all of them did follow a trend across time and showing an increase in county monthly percentages of on-site schools from December when our data collection began all the way up to May when we stopped the analysis. So pretty good levels of consistency In my opinion, different statisticians might look at the data and think different things. But if you look graphically at our patterns, there are similar patterns across time for all three data sets, the Burbio county level policy, the Facebook household level responses, and the SCDL phone GPS tracking. If you look at the state level and you look at the time trends, these three data sets are following really similar patterns. There's just different levels of estimation. So the county policies are reporting higher percentages compared to the others. Well, having looked into these data sets and uh, gotten familiar with not just what you shared here, but I'm sure there was a lot of just exploratory data analysis to be done, you're close to an expert in some sense. So I'm going to ask you an unfair question here. 
Of course, we want to minimize exposure to the virus, but we also want to maximize learning, and we want to be cognizant of mental health and a bunch of other factors that could be orthogonal concerns. Do you walk away with any good fortune cookie wisdom here about how to approach what the best policies should be? I think that it's such a hard decision, and I've seen the impacts of on-site school and virtual school in personal experience and with colleagues, and everyone has strong emotions tied to this and strong opinions. And I think that one of the biggest results that struck me was in the paper by Justin Lessler that I was involved in and seeing that there was somewhat, according to this Facebook data, there was somewhat of an increased risk of getting exposed to COVID-19 for individuals who had children attending school on site, but that risk was no longer significant if we included mitigation measures in the schools. So I think the fact that this Facebook survey was able to assess all of those different variables was really important because it allowed us to ask this question. And I think based off of that information, if we improve mitigation measures and if individuals are willing to kind of be a little bit inconvenienced from time to time, which I know from hearing and from seeing the experiences of teachers during this pandemic has been very challenging. And there's been some important work on teacher mental health as well, using the same Facebook survey data. But I think that the best that we can do to allow kids to go to school but then also put in mitigation measures that make sense and that could have an impact, just like mask wearing and different little mitigation measures that we can do. I think it's really important to try to open schools when we can, especially, again, it's it's so changing. It's so up and down. I think now we're at a point where hopefully soon these schools can be open with mitigation measures and parents can feel safe and can feel comforted that their kids are going to school and getting the socialization that I'm sure the kids are really wanting. But who knows what will happen in the future. I just think that thanks to this data, we have been able to look into the effects of school in terms of COVID spread. And it seems like if we put in some mitigation measures, it's okay. And kids can attend school without parents experiencing significant higher risks of getting exposed to COVID-19. Carly, what's next for your research? So I am hoping to continue to do some projects related to this data and COVID-19. And now that we've looked into education policies on the Facebook survey, use this survey to look more into mental distress outcomes related to school, because we have some information now about COVID spread and school policies, but there's still a lot more to be discovered about the other long-term effects of schools being closed, like on learning loss and on different mental distress levels. So I'd love to continue doing that as well. I'm also, as part of my PhD program, I'm on a completely different gear looking into machine learning methods for assessing treatment effect heterogeneity using individual level covariates. So different level, but really exciting problems in the field of causal inference and learning machine learning methods, adjusting them to include more data. Yeah, I'm hoping to continue on with some of these COVID projects, but also keep working on my methodological work as well. And is there anywhere people can follow you online? Yes, I am on Twitter at C. Lupton Smith. I am also on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, we'll have links to those in the show notes. Carly, thank you so much for taking the time to come on Data Skeptic. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. That concludes another installment of Data Skeptic Physically Distributed. Thanks to our sponsors, ClearML and Estera. Myself, Claudia Armbruster, as associate producer. Vanessa Bly, guest coordinator. Show notes written by David Abembe. And our host, Kyle Polich.